Hello and welcome. You found the Social Work Podcast. My name is Jonathan Singer, and I'll be your host as we explore all things social work. Hey there, podcast listeners. It's Jonathan. I know it's been a long time since I published an episode, and it's good to be back. I hope you like what you hear because today, Alan Barsky and I are going to be talking about the 2021 revision of the NASW Code of Ethics to include self care and cultural humility when working with clients. So it might seem hard to believe, but June 1st, 2021 is the first time that NASW officially includes self care into the Code of Ethics. Now, back in 2009, I did an episode with Mark Meyer that explored the idea that social workers do a much better job of identifying and responding to depressive symptoms in clients than we do with ourselves or our colleagues. And even though the whole episode was really about what we as social workers can do to look out for ourselves and our colleagues, neither my guest nor I ever used the word self-care. In fact, it wasn't until my 2018 episode with Erlene Grease Owens, Jay Miller, and Mindy Eaves that the word self-care appeared in a podcast episode. And that's a problem, right? When, when social workers don't take care of themselves, when social service organizations are not prioritizing the care of their employees, and this, of course, extends to when schools of social work are not prioritizing the care of their students— it affects our personal and professional lives. And this inevitably affects the services that we provide. So the Code of Ethics now encourages, quote, social work organizations, agencies, and educational institutions to promote organizational policies, practices, and materials to support social workers' self-care. So that's pretty good. Now, the second addition is that social workers are expected to engage in culturally competent practice with clients, which includes addressing oppression, racism, discrimination, and inequities, and acknowledge personal privilege. So if your client is a trans athlete and you live in a state that passed laws preventing them from participating in sports, you have an ethical obligation to address that discrimination at the micro level as well as the macro level. And social workers have been long expected through the Code of Ethics to address social justice at a societal level. But this addition really brings it home to the individual services that we provide our clients. Now, the NASW Code of Ethics doesn't make a connection between cultural humility and self-care. There is a connection. When organizations and institutions disregard the health and well-being of staff, when social workers are employed by institutions that systematically discriminate against them, it affects their well-being. Dr. Maxine Davis wrote a piece in Nature about how her experience of race-based discrimination at work affected her well-being. She wrote, quote, anti-black racism is not the only reason for worsening health but it's also responsible for curtailing successful careers and continued underrepresentation of historically excluded groups. And you can find the link to this nature piece on the Social Work Podcast website. Now, to unpack these two new additions, I spoke with Alan Barsky, professor of social work at Florida Atlantic University and former chair of the National Ethics Committee of the National Association of Social Workers. He's the author of Ethics and Values in Social Work, Conflict Resolution for the Helping Professions, and Clinicians in Court. He was also the chair of the NASW committee responsible for the 2018 revisions of the NASW Code of Ethics, which Alan and I talked about in a three-episode series. Now, lucky for you, we were able to cover the 2021 changes in about 30 minutes. So if you like what you hear today and you want to learn more about any of the resources mentioned in the episode please check out our website at socialworkpodcast.com. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at at S-O-C-W-O-R-K podcast and Facebook at facebook.com forward slash S-W podcast. 
And now, without further ado, on to episode 130 of the Social Work Podcast, Self-Care and Cultural Humility in the 2021 NASW Code of Ethics, an interview with Alan Barsky. Alan, thank you so much for being back again on the Social Work Podcast to talk about the NASW Code of Ethics. It is a real honor and pleasure, um, and I appreciate you coming back. Thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure as well. In your new Social Worker magazine column, Ethics Alive, you wrote, quote, for the first time in the history of the National Association of Social Workers, the Code of Ethics will include specific provisions on self-care and cultural humility. So can you talk a little bit about these two provisions? Absolutely. The first one is about self-care. And up until this point, we've never actually had the term self-care mentioned in the code. There were a couple of provisions about how we would react or what our responsibilities are if we have personal problems, if we're going through a divorce or mental health issues or financial issues, and making sure that they don't have an impact on our clients. And if we're working with a colleague who uh, is having personal problems, then we had responsibilities to talk to them about it and if they weren't able to address those issues and they were having a negative impact on clients then we were directed to talk to um, our agencies our professional organizations our licensing bodies in order to make sure that those current concerns were being addressed unfortunately we ne were never really proactive about self-care and if you look at the various sections of the code of ethics it starts with obligations to our clients obligations to our employers obligations to our professionals obligations to our community, but there were never really any obligations to ourselves. And so for the first time, the uh, NASW Code of Ethics does have a section now on self-care. And I'm not saying that self-care is selfish. It's actually something that's important for us to be able to pursue our other ethical responsibilities, including caring for our clients and promoting social justice in the community. I, I think it's really interesting, and I appreciate you pointing out the sort of the historical context that there's been lots of conversations about clients and, and others and, and the profession, but never the self. Uh, and I know that Jay Miller and uh, Erlene Grease Owens uh, wrote a piece saying that self-care is not selfish. What what is this? What is the specific language in the 2021 revision around self-care? So the first thing to note is that. Um, the language that was added was added to the preliminary sections, the purpose uh, sections, which don't give us the specific standards or the ethical guidelines that are enforceable. So these are really aspirational statements, statements for education, statements for encouraging us uh, about what's to do in terms of good practice, but it's not intended to be something that we can be punished for like a baseline. It's not saying, you know, like the prohibition against having sexual relations with clients that we're going to get punished if we don't do it. So it's really telling us that this is a good thing, but not necessarily something that's enforceable as a baseline. So the first part in the uh, purpose section of the Code of Ethics, um, there's a section that uh, number five that says the code socializes practitioners to the field to social workers mission values ethical principles and ethical standards what's been added and encourages all social workers to engage in self care ongoing education and other activities to ensure their commitment to the same core features of the profession so it's really linking the importance of self care to being able to pursue social works mission values and ethical principles is there something in the actual principles or standards that specifies self-care? So there is another paragraph in the purpose section that goes a little bit further. It says that professional self-care is paramount for competent and ethical social work practice. And so one of the things that we have to distinguish is what's personal self-care and what's professional. And personally, I think there's a lot of overlap between the two. If I'm taking care of myself personally, I'm taking care of my physical needs, I'm eating nutritiously, I am getting good exercise, I'm getting good sleep, that's going to help me professionally. But also in terms of uh, 
self-care. They talk about some of the professional concerns. We have professional demands, challenging workplaces, exposure to trauma experienced by our clients. And we need to be able to use self-care in that professional capacity as well as our personal capacity. So that could include things like, you know, just being able to, to say no or to work with our administrators and our supervisors if we're being overwhelmed with the number of uh, clients that we're serving or if during the situation of COVID, we're not feeling like we're being protected in terms of our mental health and our physical health, then we need to be able to advocate for us. The other thing that it actually adds is it says social work organizations, agencies, and educational institutions are encouraged to promote organizational policies, practice, and materials to support social workers' self-care. So here there's a kind of paradox. We call it self-care, but we can't do self-care alone. We need to do it with our professional colleagues, our peers, our administrators, our teachers, our uh, agencies, even the funding bodies all have to be supportive of our um, health and well-being, including our professional well-being, in order for us to be able to serve our clients and, frankly, just to take good care of ourselves. Well, one of the things that I love about that is that, you know, for all the schools of social work that, you know, teach the NASW Code of Ethics, that talk about social workers, social work students... Um, sort of practicing the code of ethics, abiding by it, there's a piece in there that says, and now schools of social work, there's a piece in here for you too. Are you asking students um, about how they're taking care of themselves? Are you responding when faculty and staff are saying, uh, this is something that would be helpful for my self-care and and that is actually consistent with the code of ethics. Not that there's a specific thing that is that is delineated in the NASW code of ethics, but that the the act of acknowledging self care and working with your organization is something that is now in there. I think that you've hit it right on the head because it's acknowledging the importance of self care. We can't tell any of the, these, these organizations that they have to do it, and we're not holding them accountable. But I think a social worker could take this to their agency or a student could take it to their school and say, hey, your code of ethics says that self care is important. Where is it in our um, policies? You know, are we getting appropriate uh, you know, paid leave? Are we getting um, appropriate supervision? Uh, does the agency or organization have provisions for um, an employee assistance program for people who may not have uh, health care coverage that covers it. So we're all in, in, in this together. And for, you know, schools of social work, you know, when COVID hit, you know, we needed to make accommodations for our students. And part of the accommodations were for, you know, students who were not just taking care of themselves, but taking care of children and uh, families and maybe weren't able to perform their required tasks in the usual way. So could we make accommodations like serving clients online or changing the uh, hours or changing the ways that people uh, complete their hours in the field. I think it's interesting that you brought up the the the, the pandemic because, of course, the the 2018 code of ethics revision that you were a part of and that we talked about on on um, previous episodes of the podcast. You know that revision really did drill down into technology, and I can't I can't imagine how <laughs> how much more confusing it would have been during the pandemic. Um, if the NASW Code of Ethics still talked about technology as if it were 1996. Um, so thank goodness you and, and, your, and your colleagues were able to get through those technology uh, revisions for the 2018 Code of Ethics. Uh, I also think it would have been amazing had schools been able to say, yes, addressing these self-care needs is also part of our code of ethics. I think a lot of schools did that. I know that at Loyola University Chicago, where I am, we, we certainly did a lot of that. But it, but it was piecemeal. It was, we're doing this because it's the right thing to do, not necessarily because it's part of our code of ethics. So... In addition to everything that you've said, I would like to note that, you know, the um, technology standards that were uh, developed in 2017 or uh, up until that point were uh, done in collaboration between the NASW, Council on Social Work Education, um, the Association of Social Work Boards, and the Association for Clinical Social Work. One of the things that that did is I think it also set up that these organizations were going to work together on future policies. And so some of the policies at the national level with NASW and CSWE uh, were 
uh, working together to figure out how to respond to COVID and some of the resources on their websites were a result of those collaborations. So yes, it wasn't in the uh, code of ethics in terms of self-care, um, but it was one of the things that was highlighted by those organizations and it was um, it, it was encouraging to see them to post policies and resources on, on their websites and to continue to work together. And the same thing with the issues around diversity, equity and inclusion have been um, developing in an inter-associational way for a while and the fact now that they are in the code of ethics uh, as well using new wording um, I think is also uh, part of uh, you know the, the context of what's going on so these latest revisions certainly do reflect our time so what's happened during COVID um, in terms of you know the trauma that people are experiencing also look at the issues of uh, racism and uh, police brutality and uh, the political uh, polarization that's been going on in this country. So that's also affected our self-care. I think that was also a motivating factor for people to say to NASW, hey, we need something on self-care in our code of ethics and now is the time. I really appreciate you talking about the fact that there is inter-organizational collaboration. Um, you know, obviously, <laughs> coordination is something that social workers in the field do all the time. So it's nice to know that our our national organizations are doing that. And uh, and it's also nice to sort of know that that narrative exists, that that this isn't just um, a siloed um, initiative on the part of NASW, that this is part of the larger profession's uh, recognition of self-care and response to um, what's been going on. Uh, for decades, but it certainly was highlighted after the Black Lives Matter movement started and then certainly uh, with George Floyd's death in uh, 2020. So um, since you've already uh, kind of alluded to it, I know that there is this change in um, our understanding of sort of cultural humility. That's what you talked about in the New Social Worker article. The, the standard uh, 1.05 was renamed. It used to be called cultural awareness and diversity, and now it's called cultural competence, uh, which which is is different than cultural humility. But can you talk about this this switch from cultural awareness and diversity and what's changed? So in the 1996 code of ethics, it was called cultural competence. And so it was only called cultural awareness for the last few years. And I think there's been a struggle within the profession and you can see this within the literature, but what's the appropriate language that we should be using in terms of how do we engage with people from diverse backgrounds, whether it's uh, race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, disability, um, all of those different ranges of uh, culture. So what's the appropriate uh, terminology? And so I am only speaking for myself. I can't speak for NASW. I was not involved in the choice of language this time. Uh, but one of the things that uh, NASW did talk about in the uh, webinar when they introduced uh, the revisions to the uh, 2021 uh, Code of Ethics is they said, you know, regardless of whether you prefer the term cultural competence, cultural awareness, cultural responsiveness, or cultural humility, there's something in there for everyone to like, and there's also probably something in there for people not to like. And I think what may have been the reason that they chose the term cultural competence for the heading is that when we look at the code of ethics as setting standards, it's setting standards for behaviors and behaviors are recognized within the term competence. Um, now there's been a huge critique about the term cultural competence because it sounds as if you're saying that I could take a couple of classes, read some books, do a little bit of work, and then I can become, you know, fully knowledgeable about what about what's best to serve uh, a particular client group. I think what we need to do in order to fit with the new definitions in uh, 1.05 of the Code of Ethics is to broaden cultural competence to include the notion that we 
do have to work on developing skills and knowledge, but part of that skills and knowledge and attitudes is a sense of cultural awareness and cultural humility. And humility being the sense that, you know, we don't know everything about the clients that we are serving. And so we need some guidance from the people that we are serving ourselves. And we should act from this point of humility rather than this view of, you know, I am the expert in somebody else's life and I know what to do for them. So they've included uh, the language of cultural humility in 1.05c, where it says social workers should demonstrate awareness and cultural humility by engaging in critical self-reflection, understanding their own bias and engaging in self-correction, recognizing clients as experts of their own culture, committing to lifelong learning, and holding institutions accountable for advancing cultural humility. So for those people who believe in cultural humility, one of the things that this uh, revision does is it actually educates uh, social workers and our agencies and the people we serve about what are some of the key components about cultural humility. And this was never included in prior uh, explanations about uh, cultural competence or cultural awareness. I think that it's it's really interesting. You mentioned that, that behaviors, you know, are measured through this idea of competence. And, and of course, the Council on Social Work Education's educational policies and accreditation standards talk about the competencies that that social work students have to um, meet in order to you know walk across the stage um, I, I think it's really interesting that there's a directive in 1.05 B um, about taking action can you talk about that section sure so you know, um, people who read this will notice that um, there were a couple of places where um, there was language like understanding and knowledge, and they have added the word demonstrate understanding or demonstrate knowledge. So there has to be an action. It's not okay for there to be something about culture in our head. It has to be something that we demonstrate through skills. But I think what you're really talking about here is that last sentence in 1.05b that says social workers must take action against oppression, racism, discrimination and inequities and acknowledge personal privilege. So a couple of things here that are brand new. First of all, this is in the part on um, our obligations to clients. We already have in part uh, six of the code of ethics, our obligations to society. And within those obligations to society, we already had an obligation to promote uh, um, social justice and take stands against uh, oppression and uh, racism uh, and inequities in all of their forms. So that's kind of interesting that they placed this here in obligations to a particular client. But what I could imagine that it's saying that's different from before is I'm working with a client and it maybe on a mental health issue, or it may be a divorce issue. And in the background of it, there's also some inequities that they're experiencing. Maybe they've been mistreated by the criminal justice system, the child welfare system, uh, they've got some health inequities, whatever it is, we have an obligation to uh, take a stand against that. And so I think perhaps what this may be doing is uh, bridging the sometimes the chasm between uh, micro work and macro work. And I'm not sure if that was actually the intention, but when I'm teaching my clients, I think I'm going to hold this out as saying, you know, there isn't really a separation between micro, mezzo, and macro. They're all linked. And guess what? Look at how it's uh, worded in 1.05. The language of the word must, that's kind of unusual for the code of ethics. Usually it says should. So must is stronger language. And I'm not sure if that was deliberate, but it uh, may be part of the movement towards anti-racism. It's not good enough for me just to be unbiased. I have to actually be anti-racist, anti-oppressive. I have to take a stand on these issues and not just be silent and say, well, I'm not being racist, so that's good enough. You know, it's really saying like ethical social work practice must acknowledge personal privilege, right? It must take action. Uh, so, so people who are uh, taking action, who are acknowledging their personal privilege, who are acting against racism, uh, anybody that says, well, you know, that's just you personally, right? That's not you being a social worker. Now, there is actually this space in the code of ethics where it's like, no, this is actually part of what it means to be an ethical social worker. 
Right. And I think it's saying whether you're working with individuals, families, groups, or doing policy or community organization, you have those uh, obligations. Because I think we did have them already under um, part six of the code. But I think this, um, you know, strengths and strengthens it. And also um, acknowledgement of, of personal privilege was never explained before uh, in the code of ethics. And I'm not quite sure about the language of personal privilege. I tried to do some research on that, you know, privilege, social privilege, that comes up a lot. Personal privilege comes up in terms of Robert's rules of order. But I think what they're talking about is, you know, privilege in terms of, you know, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, et cetera. So white privilege, heterosexist privilege, uh, cisgender privilege, that we need to be aware of that. And that may be part of what, you know, biases the way that we um, assess or intervene and we need to take uh, corrective action there. So when you look at the language in 1.05C, which says critical self-reflection, um, it's acknowledging that we do have biases and that we do need to, uh, you know, figure out how to deal with those. And that could be through journaling, through work with supervisors, with peer consultation, uh, and just this commitment to lifelong ongoing learning. The last letter in 1.05, letter E, you know, social workers who provide electronic social work services should be aware of cultural and socioeconomic differences among clients' use and access to electronic technology and seek to prevent such potential barriers, right? And I think that sort of clients' use and access is new and also seek to prevent such potential barriers is new. And if I'm correct, that's another one of those places where it seems like Yes, you, you might be working individually with someone using uh, sort of telephony or telehealth, um, but you can't just say, oh, there's a barrier <laughs> that's out of my micro practice realm. That's not really something for me to deal with. In the individual, you know, responsibilities to client section, it is saying that part of what is ethical practice is seeking to prevent such potential barriers to uh, to this use of electronic electronic technology. Yeah, so again, I think the, the framers wanted us to be proactive, not just in self-care, but proactive in terms of uh, social justice and discrimination issues. So rather than me just saying, we're gonna do you know video conferencing from now on, making sure that people have access to the technology, making sure that people have the training and the use of technology, uh, making sure that if there are some points of uh, reluctance uh, to use of technology, that we assess where is that coming from? And maybe there are some cultural differences or socioeconomic differences that we need to attend to. So in 1.05c, it says social workers should demonstrate awareness and cultural humility by engaging in critical self-reflection. And there's this parentheses, understanding their own bias and engaging in self-correction. What does critical self-reflection mean to you? When I'm working with people who are uh, different from me in terms of uh, part of their uh, social identity or social affiliation, perhaps from a different uh, sexual orientation, uh, perhaps a person with a disability, you know, I may think I've got some knowledge of that group. I may have even worked with that group in the past. But for each and every client that I'm serving, I have to perhaps sit down ahead of time before I even meet with a client and um, sit down and maybe either write down or go in and through my mind, you know, what are some of my beliefs and what might some assumptions be that might uh, hold or might not uh, hold in working with a particular uh, group? And it doesn't necessarily mean that I've got a you know, strong uh, bias against a particular population, but I might just have a, a belief that is uh, perhaps uh, skewed in some way. I'm working with a person who's uh, blind and you know, when I see a person who's blind and they've graduated from college, I just think, wow, how fantastic they are. And I have to look at that as being, you know what, if I use those words and if I give a person accolades for doing something which is, um, you know, normal for them, good for them, it's not something that's a reflection of them as being some super being because they've got a disability. Uh, perhaps I can modify how I'm going to uh, work with that client and work with them in a way that's uh, more conducive to, you know, their expectations, their hopes, and what would be supportive of them. There's a lot of times where, you know, I've caught myself in engaging in a, um, a microaggression with a student. Um, so I had a, a student 
student who uh, was uh, performing some services at uh, an agency. And I said, wow, you were able to do that as a student? And when uh, the student reacted, it's like, what's going on for you? And she said to me, you know, well, you're kind of telling me that I'm not good enough because I'm just a student, as opposed to, you know, just validating me for what I'm already doing. And so sometimes we may be thinking we're doing something positive for a client. The critical self-reflection helps us to check out those assumptions and uh, be aware of them. And so, you know, we can self-correct and sometimes our clients are teaching us, but we have to be aware to hear those messages to respond to apologize when appropriate and to take those corrective uh, actions uh, in working with them in the future. I really appreciate you um, teasing this apart because I could see this being something that a, a good clinical supervisor, it doesn't even have to be just sort of clinical work, even though this is in the sort of responsibility of the client section. Um, but, a, you know, a supervisor says, all right, so let's let's work on um, kind of figuring out what your biases are, you know, with, with these clients, especially clients that, that you've, you've, you've worked with for a while. Um, and you, you mentioned students. I know that um, uh, I got feedback from one of my students about how I was not being critical in my self-reflection in class because um, she said, you know, my classmates were expressing opinions about what the LGBTQ community thought and did, and you did not open up any space for those of us who are also in the community who think about things differently and who do things differently to share that perspective. It was almost like they were right, and that was the only way to see things or do things. And, and for me, that was, that was a really important moment um, to sort of, again, like, like, you know, you had a student who called you out and, you know, or called you in. Um, and, and this student did the same thing for me about sort of thinking through my own bias. Um, and, and it allowed me to do some self-correction to make sure that I was thinking about, oh, am I, am I making this group that's not a monolith, a monolith by basically saying, thank you for sharing with me, you know, how, how you see the world, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, that's, that, I think that's a really important piece of being self-reflective and critically self-reflective. Absolutely. And it fits with the commitment to lifelong learning. You know, we don't uh, have fewer um, opportunities for critical self-reflection as we get more experience. We have to continue in the same vein and, uh, you know, continue to be open to learning. You know, also in conjunction with the technology, more people are involved in cross-border social work, across state borders, across international borders. And so I think this is going to give even more rise to look at uh, cultural humility and awareness when working with people who we're not even physically connected with them. We don't even know their communities that uh, um, they're uh, existing in on a day-to-day -day basis or you know, when a humanitarian issue happens in a, another country for us to you know, jump to conclusions or use the um, social media to decide what's going on and what people need in those areas. Again, go back to the Code of Ethics and says, you know, recognize clients as experts in their own culture. And that includes, you know, communities and what their expertise is, what they need. Let's, you know, partner with, let's support, let's not uh, tell people what they need. Well, Alan, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with us again about the NASW Code of Ethics, this time about the 2021 revisions that you were not involved with. So <laughs> I particularly appreciate you uh, talking this through. And of course, resources will be available on the Social Work Podcast website, the new Social Worker article that you wrote. And there's, I know, a webinar through NASW about this. But um, again, I really appreciate your insight and your expertise. Thank you so much for being here. Fantastic. Thank you for also being an inspiration for social work and the ethics of our profession. I'm Jonathan Singer, and thanks for being with me today for another episode of the Social Work Podcast. If you missed an episode or have suggestions for future episodes, please visit socialworkpodcast.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit our online store at cafepress.com slash swpodcast. To all the social workers out there, keep up the good work. We'll see you next time at the Social Work Podcast.